Okay, um, can you see and and hear this? <laughs> That's always a good check. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you ever so much for the, for the introduction. Thanks also for the opportunity to speak uh, today. I think it's such an important uh, topic, and as you mentioned, we're, we're we're training the next generation of researchers, so it's important that we really engage our students with some of these uh, issues. So I'm just going to talk really about some of my uh, experiences with supervising. Uh, replication studies. These are pretty uh, low scale replications. Um, so I, I know Kay's going to be talking about something much, much grander a little bit later. So I think really we'll be able to give you the, uh, the whole gamut of different ways you can engage students with, with replication. Um, but I've got a, a long standing interest in replication attempts, which goes back to my undergraduate uh, final year project. So during my BSE dissertation, it was only one experiment. Uh, it was a replication attempt and it was a failed replication attempt. So this was back in the day when you, you, you failed to replicate something and you think you've done something wrong rather than maybe uh, the literature is, is, is uh, wrong. So um, I experienced this quite early on. So I, I know how a student feels when they engage in a replication and, and how it feels when a replication doesn't quite work out. Um, but then I went on to do my MSc and now did two experiments. The first, again, was a, a, a failed replication, this time of a study from a PhD student in the same group. So that was a, a little bit awkward. Um, and then experiment two, I tried to generalize uh, their, their, their finding to, uh, to a different scenario and just produce completely null results. Um, I then continued this trend into my PhD. I did eventually discover some things, um, but my first paper from my PhD was also uh, reporting three failed uh, replications. So these were closed replication attempts of studies in my field, and I, I didn't uh, reproduce uh, their findings. So I know how a student feels when they engage uh, in replications. Just to give you a bit of context about my supervision uh, experience and also the, just the context of, in which I supervise, because I think that really does shape how I approach um, my supervision today. I have about 12 to 14 students per year, so it's a pretty heavy supervision load. Um, I find on the whole that my students are they're, they're super keen, they're super able students, so they are able to really elevate and uh, uh, really do some quite strong uh, research with you. Um, they have huge ambitions for their projects, so what I find a lot of my time in the early days is really trying to just bring down their ambitions a little bit to make it something that's actually deliverable within the time that they're going to be working with me. They tend not to be too keen on working with, with other students, they want ownership over, over their projects and you know they, they don't want their marks to be dependent on other students. And I, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but most of my students seem to want to be clinical psychologists. So. As I'll discuss a little bit later, this is a bit of an issue for someone who views themselves as a, as a pure cognitive uh, researcher. So what I'm going to talk very briefly with you today is just some suggestions based on how I approach uh, supervision and how I embed replication into, uh, into my students' work. Um, the first one isn't about supervision at all, really. It's about the importance of uh, embedding the importance of, of replication throughout the whole curriculum. So I'll talk briefly about that. Um, I'll differentiate between direct replications and conceptual replications and provide just a couple of tips about how I approach uh, if you're just having a student just doing a one-off replication attempt. What I've been doing more recently, though, is encouraging students to add additional facets to a replication design so the students are able to have ownership over some novel aspect of their final year project, but there's a, there's a replication study embedded uh, within it, and also uh, really primarily due to my supervision load, group projects, they're the future, um, how I bake replication into uh, group projects that I have students working on nowadays. So first of all, the importance of replication throughout the curriculum, I probably don't need to, to convince people of this, but I never miss an opportunity to, to just stress that how important this is. And really, I, I think it's so important uh, for a final year project supervisor, because the challenge is that you want your students to arrive with you who need no convincing that replications aren't boring or lacking in novelty or scientific interest. You really want them to arrive already keen on the idea that, that a replication study is a worthwhile final year project. So this is what you want. You want them to have little or no convincing. And in order for that to happen, they need to have been exposed to the importance of replications throughout their whole undergraduate degree. I know the talks today are about the final year project specifically, um, but I think I've, I've found this just such an important uh, ingredient. 
So we need to embed open research reproducibility themes all the way throughout the, the degree program. And um, when I was head of school here at, at Kiel, uh, we worked on introducing this throughout the whole curriculum. So we introduced replication reproducibility in uh, year one. So in the first semester, the students are with us, we're talking about uh, reproducibility. Uh, we have pre-registrations used in year one research methods modules. Um, in year two, I dedicate a whole lecture to the replication crisis and the so-called year of horrors and all of the fallout from that. We focus our year two research methods around proposed solutions to this replication crisis, talking about power, effect sizes, Bayesian analysis, meta-analysis, uh, et cetera. And of course, we exclusively use uh, open source software. So we win most of the battle by having students arriving in the final year who know about this stuff, who realize that replications uh, are valid and important ingredient to science and they're A-OK -okay with engaging with it in their final year project. So um, if I'm wanting just a student to just conduct uh, an individual discrete piece of work on their own, maybe a student just wants to work on their own, uh, I have students conduct either a direct replication or a conceptual replication of something that we're working on uh, in the group. So just a, a definition, direct replication is a replication that's as faithful as possible. So you're trying to make everything as exact as possible to uh, an original uh, study. So you're trying not to deviate too much. Whereas a conceptual replication, this is where you're trying to test the boundary conditions of a, of a previously reported effect. It's useful to test uh, confounds that may have been uh, present in the original study, or maybe you just want to test the generalizability of the finding. So I find that students are quite happy to and, and keen to engage in direct replications and also conceptual replications, but they do have their unique uh, challenges. One useful thing that I use though is, uh, this is a little bit of a shameful plug, um, we, we published a replication recipe a few years ago. Um, so this is a paper just like a, a recipe for baking a cake. Uh, if you follow these instructions in this paper, the idea is that you should end up with a pretty convincing replication attempt. So students can use this paper to really guide their project and how they're developing their thinking around the project, basing it around this replication recipe, and they end up with a, a, a pretty good uh, and convincing replication at the end of it. I found some challenges with having students engage in direct or conceptual replications. Um, so these are things that you might encounter if you're wanting to dip your toes into this. Um, it's, it, it's difficult for students to identify on their own what is worth replicating. Not everything needs replicating. The Stroop effect has been replicated so many times it would be not worth doing it again. Um, also, close replications or direct replications are, are, are pretty much always nearly impossible for, for FYPs, um, primarily due to power demands, but, but Kay's got a great solution to that, that 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 she'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but sometimes you just don't have access to a particular population or the materials that uh, an original author has used. Um, another problematic issue is that some students, uh, but less so given the education, but, but sometimes supervisors view conducting a direct replication as a little bit of a cop out. And the students who have just, they, they view it as just copying what, what somebody else has been done requires much less intellectual input, and they view these projects as less uh, valuable than, than others. I, I completely don't agree with that, but I think there is a bit of work to be done in taking people on a journey about educating our colleagues about how important uh, replications can be. So to some tips about engaging in some of these replications, help your students identify and justify the replication target. This is typically the, the, the biggest barrier. What is worth replicating? Help them with that. Um, it's best if it's something that your research program would value, something that you're working on in your, in your research group. Um, Utilize the replication recipe. It's, it's relatively uh, uh, linear and, and foolproof. Um, so it's a, I think it's a great resource to help students work through a replication attempt. We, in that, we talk about the importance of pre-registration, and this is great for students because it helps. They basically get their introduction and method written in the first semester if they've engaged in a, in a, in a full pre-registration. But also, if you're doing a uh, high valued replication, publish the work with your students. Um, so I've, I've published several direct replications with my uh, students. Um, and of course, it's great for their career, it's great for science, but it's also great to convince next year's students that uh, engaging in direct replications are, are, are really valued and, and it can really help with their, uh, with their career profile. Something which I've been doing more and more recently, though, is to add an additional facet to a replication design. And this, this will be a little bit more straightforward to engage with. 
So if you recall that I said that most of my students want to be clinical psychologists, but I'm uh, primarily a pure cognitive psychologist. So what I've done over the past couple of years is to have my students replicate a cognitive effect, but then to add on a clinical aspect to the study. So that way everybody wins. The student gets to conduct something clinical. It's also something potentially novel. So they feel that they've got, they're adding something to uh, a replication. And I also then get to examine the robustness of the cognitive effects, because although there's a, a clinical aspect to it, I get to see, does the cognitive element of it uh, actually replicate? And um, a great example of this, a, a student of mine uh, who's graduating today, actually, the graduation ceremony is going on uh, right now. We're currently writing up a paper about depression and perceptual load. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of this, but there's the cognitive effect that, that tests uh, selective visual attention. Um, yeah, I don't have the time to go through this, but I'll skip over this. Um, but what we're able to do is we're able to replicate uh, this effect. So she was interested in this perceptual load effect, but she was also interested in, in uh, depression symptomatology. So I was interested, first of all, does this effect replicate uh, using an online sample? So I hadn't seen it being replicated using online studies. So what we're able to do is conduct the study. I get the behavioral data. So I get to see, does this perceptual load effect replicate uh, with an online sample? Overall response times are a little bit elevated. The critical effect is an interaction between these two. And we, and we've, we find that very well in the online sample. However, what my student got from it is that she was then able to see whether this, the magnitude of this perceptual load effect relates to mag, uh, severity of depression symptomatology. We found a, uh, a small but a highly significant negative uh, relationship between these two that we're now following up uh, in ongoing work. So this is a way that if you have students who feel that, well, I'm, you know, I'm not really able to do much novelty if I'm just doing a direct replication, there's ways to add things to it to make it novel for the student, but you get to view uh, replication rates in a particular field. I've enjoyed this type of work so much, I've actually pivoted my research mission to incorporate this type of work. So on my website now, I, I say that my mission of my lab's work is to conduct fundamental research to understand cognitive control. That's how it was before. And now due to this work that I've been doing with my students, I then use this knowledge to tackle clinical and applied questions. So I think this is just a really nice way if you, if you uh, engage your students in an authentic way with replication and the work that you're doing, it can actually influence your own research as well. And I found that of, of great value. So the final one, and this is really where I'm finding the most bang for my buck in terms of students' value, but also my value as, as, as a researcher, is, is having our students work in group projects. The motivation, I said, is that we've got a large uh, supervision load, and I personally find that quite hard to manage. Typically, I had 14 independent studies going on, and my Adley mind wasn't able to keep up with all of them. Um, I also wanted the students to have a real research lab experience where they're, they're, they're sharing their research with others who are working on a similar question, provides your students with an instant study support group. Um, but importantly, related to this talk, you get to combine studies to produce a meaningful contribution where replication is basically baked into the design of your group projects. So imagine these are all my, in, in, in my 12 students have all got independent uh, ideas about what they want to do. What I try and do is I base them into groups of four and have each of them address a particular research question. This can either be something that I'm interested in or something that students generate themselves. It has to relate to the mission of my group's work. Um, but what I'm able to do within this, because students are working on a similar problem, I'm able to bake replication into it. So for example, a project I'm uh, working on this year, relation between depression symptomatology and task switching performance, uh, one student is using the Beck's depression inventory and using a queued task switching design. Another student is using the same questionnaire, but is looking at a voluntary task switching paradigm. So I get to see how well the, the effects replicate across uh, just a, a conceptual replication of task switching. I've got another student looking at rumination tendencies and voluntary switching. So here I get to see whether the behavioral effects replicate, but just looking at different clinical questionnaires uh, and so on. So you see you've got replication sort of built within there because they're all conducting a task switching design. Maybe your lab, your lab has just detected a new effect and you want to test the boundary conditions of it. You could have one student conduct a direct replication and then your other three students conduct conceptual replications. As a whole, they're um, working on independent projects. 
but what you're getting from it is testing the robustness of a particular effect. Maybe you're interested in how your new effect that you've just discovered differs across different clinical profiles. You have one student look at depression, another anxiety, schizotypy, ADHD, et cetera. All of them will be replicating your original uh, effect. So you get to test the robustness across all of those, but each student will get something of value from all of it because each will have a different uh, particular clinical uh, interest. Um, so that's what I've found quite useful over the past few years. And I've been getting some success in terms of student satisfaction, uh, but also driving my own uh, research as well. Um, so a bit of a win-win situation. And that's me. Thank you very much.